special guest with us, uh, Dr. Joyce Osland, who I'll introduce in just a moment, but wanted to welcome you all and thank you for coming out on not so, such a lovely evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Clinton. I'm the CEO here at Cultural Vistas. Um, and it's great to welcome so many friends. We have a great representation of our board members. If I can just have our board members, Cultural Vistas board, raise their hands so folks recognize them from coming from many parts of the country. So thank you all for being here. Uh, so a little bit about, so those of you, there's a couple people in the room who don't probably have much experience with Cultural Vistas, so just a word about who we are, what we do. Our mission is to advance global skills, build careers, and connect lives through international exchange. So we shape, we help shape the careers of thousands of individuals uh, that participate in our programs every year uh, that are work-based uh, international experiences. And um, we talk a lot about how important the skills that they're building through the international work experiences are and how it helps them really advance their careers. Um, but we're recognizing that it's important that we get a little more specific than that, not just that we're building global skills, but what exactly are those skills that we're building? How does it make a difference for their careers? How can they go and talk to an employer about um, what those skills are and what they mean? And particularly as the workforce is, um, the, the workplace is changing and shifting so rapidly, uh, being able to be clear about um, those, those, the skills that uh, require adaptability, um, resilience, uh, and many, many other things that you, you get through being uh, in an experience that takes you outside your comfort zone. So uh, an effort that we're putting forth and the board is very supportive of uh, is for us as an organization to do more uh, work on de better defining the skills that we're developing through these abroad experiences. Um, so we'll be talking, we have a board meeting tomorrow, we'll be talking uh, quite a bit about that um, and really getting our staff and um, uh, more uh, aware and um, working on being able to deliver these, um, these global skills in, in, in meaningful ways. So, with that, is we had brought, uh, we invited Dr. Joyce Oslin, who is an expert um, in this field, to share a little bit about um, what what the field of um, intercultural competency is, global skills and competencies are, um, to help us think about and advance our efforts to um, bring this work uh, more uh, in, into cultural vistas. So a little bit about Joyce. Uh, she's an internationally known specialist in international management and the founder and executive director of the Global Leadership Advancement Center at San Jose State University. So Joyce is flown across the country to be with us today. Um, Joyce's interest, research interests are global leadership development, expert cognition in global leaders, and repatriate knowledge transfer. She focuses on practical ways to improve global skills and organizations. She's got over 100 publications, research articles in leading academic journals, as well as practitioner articles, books, and cases. Joyce lived and worked overseas for 14 years in seven different countries, mostly in Latin America and West Africa. She worked in the field of international development as a program manager, trainer, and consultant, and also spent three years as a full-time faculty member and consultant. So Joyce, it's a pleasure to have you. Looking forward to your talk, and um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I discovered that my son-in-law, who lives in Germany, with my daughter and my grandchildren, first went overseas with Cultural Vistas. So it's your fault that my grandchildren are so far away. <laughs> but as I always say, when you raise your kids all over the world, you can't complain when they don't live down the street. So this is kind of how I got here. I'll explain the cows at the end, OK? So I was a Peace Corps volunteer, but uh, not there. Uh, at one point, I lived in Burkina Faso with not that child, another child who you can't see it there, but has her legs in casts because <coughs> she had a problem. And the doctors insisted that I learn how to cast her because there was no one in the bush who could do this. She's not crippled. I was worried, but she's not crippled. But that's the, you know this is a typical expat story, right? OK, I, I did my dissertation on the personal transformation that expatriates undergo. And it, it was this book. I think it costs $1.38 now on Amazon. 
I'm telling you this because I get no royalties from it. Uh, I did a doctorate in organizational behavior, and I had the great good fortune to have David Kolb, I don't know if you've heard of him, Mr. Experiential Learning, who uh, was one of my advisors, and we wrote a textbook together. But I love experiential learning. It's just, it's my thing. So everything I've done really has to do with personal transformation. And then I got involved in assessment with the COSI group, and I'm still doing this, but mainly with respect to global leadership. I spend most of my time on global leadership. This is uh, the center that I run. That's our mission. And this is why we do it. And we had the gall to, to adapt Einstein's saying. We added or leadership in there. It's not just thinking that has to change. Leadership has to change. So here's my agenda, I think, unless you stop me. You know, um, I want to talk about the business case for why these things are important, these global competencies are so important. I want to talk about, well, can you measure them? And yes, you can after, what are they? And then also, how do we develop them? If you have a question, please feel free to stop me, OK? I might tell you, hold that till later, but uh, feel free to speak up. Very briefly, what we find in the, in the field of, of business is that there aren't enough global leaders. Uh, and businesses don't think they're preparing them as well as they should be. And some businesses have even had to stop their global strategies because they don't have the people to carry them out. To me, that screams crying need for global leaders, which I think is relevant for cultural vistas. There's, there's a market out there for people who have global leadership development. And it's not just business. There's a scarcity of global leaders in all sectors. I'm not going to read you everything on these slides. I'm just going to point out certain things. But this was a large study. And of over 2,000 multinationals, 52% of them were planning to expand globally, but only 16% had enough global leaders ready to do the work. So it's, a, it's kind of a crisis. So what is global leadership? This is a, this is a maybe not the official academic term, but simply influencing the thinking, attitudes, and behaviors of a global community to work together synergistically towards a common vision. Now, I don't expect you to remember that, but I think you might remember this. Extreme leadership, OK? If you think of extreme sports, the difference between regular leadership and global leadership is like the difference between traditional sport and extreme sports. More challenging, more difficult, riskier, sometimes involves global, right? Are you an extreme sport person? I see you nodding back there. She, she is, she's a closet. Look at her. And I only mentioned you because your mouth was full, too. <laughs> and the wonderful thing about global leadership is that it's so suited to diversity. If you have global leadership skills, you also have diversity skills, which is very important. All kinds of research today showing that organizations that do diversity well also perform well in many different ways. This is the competency model we use for global leadership. And I'm showing you only because I want you to see how much of this is intercultural. Global mindset, you know, this is cognitive, attitudes and cognition, all these interpersonal skills, mindful communication, building relationships, teaming. We could put, we could put conflict up there. We could put negotiation up there. Those are all intercultural, related to intercultural. And then we have these system skills at the top that really build on all of these things. So intercultural competence is a key aspect of global leadership. It's not all of it, but it's a, certainly a key component. Now, what about global competencies? So on this hand, we have internal cognitive abilities. Some of this is knowledge, right? Regional knowledge. And then we have these famous not-so-soft skills. People call them soft skills, but they're wildly important. I'm sure, as many of you know, you can send someone with great technical skills to another country, but that's no guarantee that they'll succeed. If they don't have these not-so-soft skills, we're probably going to be in trouble. So tolerance of ambiguity, resilience, critical thinking, intellectual curiosity, creativity, attitudes, extremely important. And then we have, again, more interpersonal 
competencies on the other side, linguistic, transactional, teamwork, leadership, negotiation, ability to deal with failure, because of course we fail. And uh, that's why learning to learn quickly and fail quickly and get back up again is so important. And then just understanding how to behave or do business or whatever it is that you do in another culture. High correlation between soft skills that employers are seeking and having experience, having an immersion experience. 92% of employers are looking for personality traits like these. So there's a need, right? This is the business case in, in the sense, not that you only work in business. I don't mean that, but I mean that there is a need for these skills. Here are some statistics. Some of these have to do with study abroad. And some of them have to do, these, have to do with HR, what HR managers are looking for. Of the top four things in one study that they were looking for, here we have cross-cultural experience. And this is not alone. There are many, many, many studies that say that employers are seeking these things. So we're in good shape. Now, let me ask you, and I forgot to tell you when I showed you the agenda, I put, I put the case of cultural vistas at the bottom, and then I said, be prepared for questions, right? Yeah, can you? Sure. There's research on that it's not just US. There's all kinds of research out there, yeah. So anyway, I would like to ask you, I'm gonna ask you questions every once in a while just to make sure you're still awake. <laughs> and because I'm curious. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been saying that these are reasons why we should be focused on this area. So why else do global competencies and diversity and inclusion matter to you all? Anything else other than what I have already said? Yes. Um, innovation. I, I think the diverse populations and the ability to, all of those skills lead to innovation within organizations. That's true. <coughs> um, there's a wonderful book called Collective Genius that talks about how you lead organizations. And, and one of the things that those leaders do is they build a diverse, inclusive culture that allows people the freedom to be creative. And of course, people who have global experience are more creative, according to research. Thank you, Kendra. OK, so I was asked to talk about whether or not you can actually measure global competencies. And the answer is yes, but. So let me tell you first, I, I will tell you what I answer. I get phone calls all the time. Joyce, we want to we wanna use an instrument. <laughs> And so I asked them about a million questions about what exactly they're trying to do, et cetera. But this is what I have to explain first, that there are basically three different types of instruments that we think about. There are cultural gap measures that measure how different you are in terms of cultural values from someone else. Globesmart, Cultural Wizard, Hofstetters. So, so those, if we're from different cultures, as this guy is, right? It might be good for him to take one of those and find out just exactly how different he is from these people. So that's what we call cultural gap measures. And I, I love those instruments. I think they're very helpful. But they do not tell us whether someone is skilled at dealing with this, right? It just tells us what the difference is. Then there are a raft of intercultural adaptability measures that only focus on that topic. They're over 60. And then there are a few global leadership measures uh, out there. There's probably about, I would say, four. The thing is, not all these instruments are equal. Some have been very carefully created by scholars uh, you know, and followed all the laws for good instrumentation. And I actually know of one where the guy made it up over the weekend. You know. 
he figured he could do it, and by God, he did. But it, I don't think he charges for it, at least. So that's that's encouraging. But so we have to be careful what you want to do with it, and then also pick wisely. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, competencies. When we use the word competencies in, in my field, we usually define this as skills, attitudes, behaviors. You know, so it's, it's kind of a catch-all term in a way. But what it means is these are things that lead to superior performance. OK? That's what we're talking about. So if we go back to this guy, Lyle Spencer is one of the founders of competency. He said, why try to teach a chicken to climb a tree when you can hire a squirrel? And that's the purpose, because competency research works like this. In an organization, you figure out who are the top performers. And then you figure out, well, what characteristics do they have or what attitudes, behaviors, right? What is it that sets them apart from everybody else? And if you're really serious, you also look at the worst people in the organization and find out what is going on with them, right? And those bit, the top characteristics, that's what we mean when we, when we seriously say competency, a competency study. So I'm going to tell you about uh, an instrument that I am connected with, that I work with. And it was developed by first looking at all the research on expatriate effectiveness that was done at that time, all kinds of expats, sojourners, Peace Corps volunteers, missionaries, everybody. They did an analysis on all of that and came up with three buckets of competencies. And this is still true today. They have done it again several times. And they also looked at uh, literature on intercultural communication and also global leadership. So we're talking about perception management, relationship management, and self-management. This is somewhat similar to the self, other self bridge. Is that how you say? Self other bridge, OK. So perception management assesses how individuals perceive the world around them and how their perception affects their subsequent learning about that world. So it's not just what you can pick up. It's also what sense are you making of that, and what are you doing with it, what you've learned. And these are the competencies that make up this category. Introspexibility refers to your willingness to take on new hobbies or new interests in other countries rather than sticking with ones that you've done at home. Because by doing that, you, you learn more. You, you're more likely to develop relationships and learn more. Relationship management, and I don't know about you, but I never was able to get anything done in other countries unless people liked me. Yeah? <laughs> Unfortunate when you think about it, but no, it was it's important to build those relationships. So it assesses a person's orientation toward developing and maintaining positive relationships with people from the other culture. So it's your interest in people who are different from you. It's your ability to main, create and maintain relationships with those people. Social flexibility at the bottom is really code switching. You know, are you willing to change your behavior and adopt a behavioral script from another culture, even if it makes you uncomfortable? And what we know from research on this, there's a guy named Andy Malinsky who's done a lot of research on code switching. What he found is that the major blockage to that or barrier that people had in doing that was that they felt like they were not being authentic. Isn't that interesting? So I try to tell people it's not really about identity. I mean, I know you want to think of it that way, but it's really about being effective. So if you have to take on a behavior to be effective, that doesn't necessarily have to threaten your identity. Self-management, it assesses your natural and learned capabilities to maintain a healthy emotional state when faced with challenging situations. The bottom three have to deal with stress, because we know how stressful this is. So this is an example of a competency study that also dealt with global competence and global leadership competency. This is what a group report used to look like. It's been updated. But I'm showing you this only because 
if you have something like this, then you can determine what the needs of the group are and then figure out how you can help them. This group is very well in perception management, not so well, these are our highest results, not so well in relationship management, and fairly decent in um, self-management. But overall, they're in good shape. You can't see it probably because this table, but most of their people are at the high end here. OK, so why we do these things is because we want people to understand themselves better. We want them to know where they are. And then really, we want them to develop themselves. That's the purpose, right, of assessment. So we, we have found that if we have people do personal development plans, and then if they report to us on how they're doing and write up something at the end about how they've progressed, that, that they can do amazing things. Um, Mark Mendenhall, who's a, just an outstanding scholar in this field, has written several things on how you do this with people and why it works. And it, 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 I, I wasn't convinced in the beginning, but I've been doing this with my students for probably 10 years. And I love to read their reports. And it's very easy for them then to tell potential employers what they learned, how they did it, and they're, I think, they're equipped with a method to improve themselves in the future. This is something they can use for the rest of their career. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Even if they're not going abroad? Yes. Some organizations do use it. And do you have to tweak this significantly? No, because it's really all about difference. It's all about managing difference. I mean, you could, you could use an instrument that was more specifically targeted at diversity, right? Those exist. But this, yeah, it seems to work well. Good question. This is why this personal development thing works. It's because it's based on cognitive behavior therapy which is the most popular form of uh, therapy, the most effective, I would say, according to research. But it's also the easiest to research. Spoiler alert, right? So we don't know. But anyway, there is, there is some science about this. OK, so I'm, I'm moving to, de to um, how do we develop people? So I first of all want to show you some caveats about developing intercultural confidence, which some people call three C's. So college, uh, cultural knowledge does not equal intercultural confidence. We know this from observation, don't we? I have friends who are PhDs in things like this, and I wouldn't go to a restaurant with them. I love them. I love them. But I certainly would not go to another country with them because they just don't know how to behave, right? So. Yeah, I just like to admire them from afar, and we just get together, the two of us. <laughs> so the other thing that is not a given is language fluency. That, too, does not equal intercultural confidence. We've seen that, too, haven't we? I mean, it's good to have. It certainly helps you. But that doesn't mean you're necessarily competent. It just means you're very fluent. Different stages of learner readiness require different types of training. Intergroup contact does not always reduce prejudice. You know, this, this was a hope of ours, wasn't it? That if we, if we just exposed people to people who were different, that, that they would get along, they would not be prejudiced. It didn't work. So let me show you what does work, though. Um, Pettigrew and Trope did a meta-analysis of all the research that was done on contact theory. And they came up with these things that were, that were researched quite a bit that, that mediate the impact of contact on prejudice. So which do you think of these three things? What do you think is the most important for actually diminishing prejudice? New knowledge about the other group, anxiety reduction, or empathy and perspective taking with the other group? Who are you going to place your money on? Huh? Anxiety? OK. Empathy. Empathy? Nobody's voting for new knowledge? It's because you're smart. Look, 
knowledge is useful but of minor importance. You know, to a professor, this is, <laughs> this is something to take into consideration, right? Because don't most professors, we, we deal in knowledge, right? We deal in trade in knowledge. And a lot of our programs deal in trade in knowledge. Now, I'm not saying don't give them any knowledge, but if you're thinking that that's going to reduce prejudice and that's going to make people work well together, it's, it's not going to be enough. Yes? How can we have anxiety about the outcome? Or now? I mean, how? Talk a little bit about how, how they reinforce or don't. Oh, well, they could, they could reinforce each other, but you can, for example, you can create a learning community with a workshop, right? And set some ground rules and model things and force them to interact in nice ways uh, and set a stage that, that will reduce people's anxiety. <clears throat> but you haven't necessarily started doing anything that relates to empathy and perspective taking. It would be a first step. And anxiety reducing is usually a first step. Right? Does that answer your question? OK. And look, that's a real ad from Switzerland, Switzerland over there, yeah. with the black sheep. So there's research that shows that ex expats who were ethnocentric before they went overseas came back even more ethnocentric because they were confirmed. You know, they looked for things that confirmed what they tended to believe. So, you know, ethnocentrism is a red flag, I think, for sending people, but it, it, it certainly has to be addressed. It can't be left alone. We can't assume that just because they're in another country, things are going to go well. Okay. Learning emerges from the ability to construe events and reconstrue them in transformative ways. You know, Milton Bennett always says you can't be in the vicinity <laughs> of a of an intercultural experience, being in the country isn't enough. So we have, to, we have to make sure people are doing this and help them do this. And then we know from study abroad that if you want to maximize it, they need mediated learning. Someone there that they can ask questions to and who can explain things so that, again, they don't learn the wrong things. Um, this, I think, is hugely important, not just because my name's on the end of it. I wasted a whole summer on this research, let me tell you. It was, and it was pretty sad, but earth-shaking, because here's why. We read everything in the world that had been written on the effectiveness of cross-cultural training. And I don't know why, but I read dissertations. You know, don't, don't read dissertations. Wait till they're published. If they're good, they'll be published. Otherwise, <laughs> some of those did not deserve to be dissertations even. But anyway, what we found out was that all those studies of programs showed that People were gaining knowledge, but they were not changing attitudes. They were not adapting. They were not uh, performing better. They just had knowledge. So sad but true. And actually, of all those things, the cultural assimilators were, were deemed the most effective uh, technique at the time. But this, I, I'm going to talk about this later, because miserable as it was, it, it it really changed the way that I teach and train people. So any other caveats that you take into consideration that I haven't listed? Yes? I don't know if it's a caveat, but it's really a question. At first line, if there's many emerging from groups to events and we can see them in transformative ways, there's a lot of discussion and theory about the importance of reflection right. and taking time, not yeah. only doing the learning, but then spending up the time to actually reflect what does the learning mean to me and right. what do I do with it. How does that fit in to them? Because that would be part of the construing and reconstruing. We would hope that that would be what was going on in reflection. And you're absolutely right. All the research shows that reflection is extremely important. Learning up in technical ed, there's a lot of programs that expose people to cultural, cross-cultural experiences, but don't factor in the time right. to say, what have you done? What does it mean to you? Where do you go next? Right. No, it's, it's, it's a flaw. And the same with this. You know, 
I mean, this, this knowledge has been out for a while, but after I saw that, I redesigned my programs to make sure that there was something in the day, maybe, maybe to begin the day with questions or put, put people in teams so they could help each other and, and uh, you know, yell if they had a question, but it's very important. I'm wondering if you've ever kind of stepped back and looked at some of these um, personality indicators, whether uh, personal index, Meyer Briggs, and those kind of things, and found that a particular type of person falling within those might be more suited to learning any of these um, and following whatever the type of person you want to be. Maybe you can start them. You know. Right, right. Um, uh, we we have looked at, and others too, have looked at the big five that researchers tend to use um, instruments like that. Um, so there, there is data that shows that people that have certain personality characteristics do better as expatriates. And in fact, I have some, something to show you that they, they actually can take advantage of cross-cultural training better too. So yes, there, is, there are antecedents, what we call, you know, some people are better equipped already to do some of these things. You're absolutely right. That's right. <laughs> That's true. Some of our chickens, we know how to climb a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Are there other things that you, you know, you've learned that, that have to be taken into consideration? Yeah, Kendra. I guess just one other would be something you had mentioned earlier, which was um, at a different point was putting something into the a performance review. So if, if there's got to be an accountability, right. some kind of follow up in order for these things to work. Okay, so the the um, we were just I, I mentioned that whenever I consult with organizations, I ask to see the performance appraisal form. Because I want to know if people are being measured on these things or or re for, rewarded for them, right? And you'd be surprised how many times there's absolutely nothing in there about something that an organization is paying a lot of money to promote. So it, it, ideally, uh, if we want competencies, uh, it should be a holistic approach to them. You know, we're thinking about selection, we're thinking about training and development, we're thinking about performance appraisal, and it all fits together. Okay, here's what we know about global leadership development. And remember, this is a young field. So it's not a linear process. It's nonlinear. You see people go along, go along, and all of a sudden, whoops, you know, they'll, they'll make a big leap, which is fun to watch. Maddening, <laughs> but fun to watch. Um, it, all the global leadership development models have personal transformation as their centerpiece. It doesn't happen without personal transformation. Keep that in mind, because later on that's going to be important. Here's something that I love. Look, it's not just about learning, it's about unlearning. Because something that they did in their own culture that made them successful, maybe even wildly successful, will not fly in another culture. And then you're asking people to give up something, right? Uh, and not, not everybody is, is capable of doing that. It's best accomplished through experiential learning, through reflection, Howard, and multi-method designs. So we're, we're doing a lot of things with people. We're not just relying on one method, training method. This is one of the earliest research findings. And they said that people were developed through training, teams, travel, and transfer. So in the cultural vistas world, it's transfer. You're talking, your changes are transfer. And that was viewed as the thing that was most powerful. The, for years, we believed that. Now, recently, we've discovered that um, training methods, no, wait a second. I think I, I wanted to put something else in here. Let me move this table. I think some of you probably can't see. Recently, we've discovered that it is possible to have short-term uh, immersions for people. And if they're carefully designed, they are effective. And so that saves people money. 
because of course it's very expensive to send people overseas. So this is important. Um, if you're going to use training methods, they should be highly experiential, you know, as experiential as possible, and there should be a lot of feedback from people. Good feedback too, not just feedback from anyone, because they have to they have to learn that what they're doing is not working, so that they're motivated to unlearn or to learn something new that they need. Cross-cultural mentors, if you are pairing people up and you have the ability, always pair them with people from another culture, because they learn more, right? Non-work cross-cultural experiences are just as good as training things that companies do. You know, these mission trips that people take or, or study abroad trips in high school, have people that have done those are farther along in their journey. Um, here, this is for you. So those higher and extroversion, this is from the big five. Emotional stability and openness benefit more from cross-cultural development experiences. Okay, so if, if we didn't have a lot of money and we had to choose, we would give them the big five and only take them. And then it's important to leverage normal activities. Now, this is uh, basically a business approach, but you know, people are already going on business trips. We know that they, they can develop global mindset if they use personal development plans and reflection on their business trips. So there, I think there are things that we can do in organizations that don't cost a lot of money, but we have to leverage everything we can. OK, international service learning programs. That's what I was talking about. This is actually corporate Peace Corps. Uh, IBM was one of the first to do this, and they, they based it on Peace Corps. So those have been very effective, and they're, they, it's good to do those if you can't afford to have people be expats. I've talked about development plans. OK, this relates to adult learning, too. Perspective transformation results from exposure to a disorienting dilemma, engaging in self-examination and exploration of options to make sense of the dilemma and solve it, and then finally, cognitive, affective, and behavioral integration of the insights. So this is Mesero, one of the key people in adult learning. And then I put this here just because I want you to know these people, Mendenhall, Weber, Arnaudetour and Odu, they just wrote something brilliant in terms of developing global leadership. It's, um, it's, it's the most complete thing out there, and it talks a lot about what we know in the field. So if you're at all interested, I would say read that. Now, back to this, my lost summer. So this is the key question. How do we develop more than global and cultural knowledge in people? I mean, aren't, don't all of us in some way, shape, or form are dealing with that? How do we make sure it's not just knowledge? And that's when I had to change my teaching to some degree. So this is a way to look at this. Let's say you want to produce globally competent participants. I, I imagine that's what Cultural Vista has, has in mind, OK? So if you know what you want there, if you have a clear profile of what you want, and what that means to you, then we go over here to the person that falls into your clutches, and we have to ask ourselves, well, would they get there on their own, or are they already there? This is why we assess people, because we don't know this. We can't say that we've done something if we don't know what they're like when they fall into our hands. So if you assess people too, then that gives you a clearer idea of what they need or don't need, right? And then you can design, you can do better designing here based on their needs. But the key question here is, well, what are we really doing with our intervention? And is it doing enough? So this is a lot of soul searching, I think. But it's very helpful soul searching because if you go through this, you'll probably maximize whatever it is you're doing. I hope based on some of those things that I went over about development, you could use some of those things. Or, you know, there's other, there are always ways that we can maximize, I'd say, improve our program to make them better and more transform, potentially transformational. Does that make sense? And this is just a way to help us think about this conceptually. Now, 
This is what I think about all the time when I'm designing. Where am I on this graph? So here I have the degree of actual experience. This has to do with experiential rigor. So how close to real life am I here? Here's, here I'm low, here I'm high. Down here, I'm talking about the power of the feedback sources I have. How much feedback are people getting and how good is that feedback? There, up there, is where I have the best potential for changing people. That's transformation occurs up here. So if I want to really change people, then I have to make sure I'm operating up at the top of that rather than down here. And so what do you notice about this? It's the first thing that strikes you about this area right here. Lecture, self-study, cultural briefings, film books, business seminars. Yes. Right. And isn't this what a lot of education is right here? Lectures, like I'm doing right now. <laughs> OK, but I mean, honestly, this is generally how we tackle these things. Not everybody, but there's a lot of this going on. And, and there's no reason why we would ever get transformation out of this. I don't care how riveting you are. OK, we're a little better off here. You know, it's, it's more real world. They're getting feedback. That's why the cultural assimilator training, you know, you, you find out right away if you guess the right answer or not, and then it educates you a little bit. That's why that is in this category, language training. But we don't get up to transformation until we're talking about you know, really strategic international business trips where they have to solve a problem in another country, a real problem. Planned field experiences that are carefully designed. Not those bus trips. Not those bus trips. Ain't nothing good happening on those bus trips except for, you know, I'm getting to know you, you're getting to know me, we're having fun. But if that's all it is, you're not getting any transformation, right? Remind me, I'll tell you a story about how I tried to salvage a bus trip. OK, non-buffered expatriate assignments. I mean, they're not living in a gated community. You know, they're, they're negotiating for themselves in the community, right? OK, high quality personal coaching. Because if you have a great coach, then you're getting really good feedback. Okay, and they're, and they're setting you up for more things like that. A great coach. Global assessment centers that uh, give people a battery of instruments and that watch them like a hawk and then tell them what they're doing. This takes me back to my cows. Remember I showed you those cows? Well, when I was doing my master's degree, I was, uh, I was supposedly doing therapy with schizophrenics in a mental hospital. I was doing my best. But I was also 21, and um, we lived on, uh, we rented a farmhouse, and there were winter cows in front of us. And I was shy. Yeah, I know this might be hard to believe. But I would go out every day and talk to those cows, and I would pretend they were my group, my therapy group. And I'd say to the cows, I'd practice my patter with the cows, right? Welcome to the therapy session. <laughs> Bessie, you look like you have something you'd like to contribute. Because, you know, this was all foreign to me. So I practiced with those cows every day till it started to feel a little better. And then the funny thing was that the, the real farmers came over in the spring with their truck. And they, my husband and I were out there. Because any time the real farmers came, you know, we were like, wow, what are they going to do now? You know, this was... And they said, stand back. They've been out here all winter alone. They're going to be wild. They're dangerous. I said, oh, wait just a minute. And so I went up into the truck. I stood on the thing, you know, the, the platform into the truck. And I said, welcome to our therapy session. And they just walked in. <laughs> but <laughs> I realized uh, someone was interviewing me about, you know, we have this uh, lab, a global leadership lab, which is an assessment center, and we watch people like a hawk and all this stuff. And I realized that really it started with the cows. <laughs> so I was trying to replicate. Okay. So, so and, and really, we do watch people like a hawk. Uh, did you know she flinched when you said that? 
And would you like to say that again? How else could that have been said? And then sophisticated simulations that are really complex, that are, that are usually they're from some real situation, but they're hard and demanding of people. So I find this helpful. I mean, I do some of this, of course, but I want to make sure that, you know, when I think about everything I'm doing with the group, I want to make sure I'm up here most of the time. OK. So you guys, the case of cultural vistas. So what demands are placed on cultural vistas participants? I guessed at these. I was just guessing. You, you tell me if I'm right or, right or not. Or anything you'd take off that or, or put on? Yeah. I would add representing your country. OK, representing your country. Very important. Yes. Managing uncertainty. Managing uncertainty, absolutely. Language? Yeah. Yep. Language. Language, sorry. Sometimes it's a group of cultures. It's not just mm. one culture going to another. It's right. A conference that you know encompasses a number of different cultures that they have to engage with each other. Yeah, so it's much more global and much more complex. OK. Yes? I would also add, I don't know what the concise bullet point is for this, but for college age participants doing the, their first round of real adult things, looking for a job, looking for an apartment, uh -huh. in another setting. Right. Yeah. Being out there. <laughs> yes. Their first job, too. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of learning going on, which is why in all of this, learning quickly and adapting quickly is, is so important. And one more. Yes. Leaving the familiar. Yeah. I think sometimes getting people just to be willing to leave behind things. That's right. Is, is the first step before they even enter the You've got to disengage. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, I know we all complain about people being on their devices, right? Mm -hmm. So that they're not interacting, but being willing to turn off the device too and just put yourself out. Yes. Purpose. Purpose? Say more. This purpose gathers all the other Okay. It's the trigger. Okay. The figure rather than the ground is purpose. Yeah, truly. I think a lot of times people people have a, they have a sense of mission in some way, and that has to make them willing to make the sacrifices that have to be made to go to another country. I mean, some are either easier than others, but there's almost always some sacrifice involved, which be it giving up the familiar, whatever it is. Yes, certainly stepping out of your comfort zone. Right. So let me, let me show, let's see. I have one thing here. We, this is another research area that I work in. And what we found was that it's very difficult for, ex, for repatriates to come back and share their knowledge. Very difficult. And one guy said, it's like talking to your cat. That was my favorite quote. Because <laughs> they have no context for it, right? And very few organizations really care, unfortunately. So one of the things I got most excited about in this research was that we discovered that there was actually a skill set toward about transferring that knowledge. And it was this, limit the knowledge transfer to the right moment. You know, don't be the spouting in so-and-so. They do it like this. You know, you can do that like twice, and that's it. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, did you make that mistake? <laughs> OK, so wait till the right moment, the teachable moment, when they want the knowledge, not when you want to give it. Wait until they trust you. Don't be a know-it-all or a bore peg. I mean, we don't like that when people do that in our own country, right? Let me tell you about Miami. Miami again. 
transfer knowledge that they think is relevant and critical to their job. Again, that teachable moment when it's relevant and critical. Wait until they ask for it, the hardest thing of all, because of course, we're brimming over with things, right? <laughs> this has been maybe the most significant experience of our life. We know all this stuff and, you know. And then be persistent, but not annoying. So it's an influence process. I think if you think of it as an influence process rather than here's a one time, you know, I'm going to share my wisdom with you, it works better. So you can't be autocratic. You have to self monitor for yourself. <laughs> Wait for the teachable moment. See it as an influence project. So, you know, I got to thinking that maybe, maybe this could be useful to people like Peace Corps volunteers and people like Cultural Vistas who are, who are in some ways in the business of transferring knowledge in some cases, or even when they come home. I remember I, the first time I came home, I had so, where was I? I think I was in Africa. I had so much to say. And we were in the car with my parents, and my dad said, well, have you been following professional sports? Dad, I didn't even have electricity. <laughs> and furthermore, I wanted to tell you about Burkina Faso. <laughs> and he was interested. You know, most people aren't. <laughs> so. I was looking for a woman doing an unfamiliar thing. I figured Sandra Bullock in space with a, with a real, the lady on the left, Katie Coleman, is a real astronaut. And then about personal transformation, Joanne Louis, the president of Doctors Without Borders, shown there in Afghanistan, said, I wanted to change the world, but the world changed me. And then I love this proverb from Africa. When I was a young man, I wanted to change the world. When I was middle-aged, I wanted to change my village. Now that I am an old man, I want to change myself. So good luck with all your transforming people. I, I think you're doing wonderful work. It's very important, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. I wanted to go back to the issue of anxiety reduction, if you don't mind, because sure. if I were... I'm a little anxious about it, but I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> because if you were to ask me, how do you reduce anxiety about something? I would say, give them knowledge, give them perspective. Uh, but that's not yeah. it, so how? Okay, I always try to think of this. Here's one person, here's another person. If I'm anxious, that's an emotion, not cognitive. So you want to do something that responds to that emotion rather than something that responds to their cool. intellect. Yeah, and I think related to that, it's about affirmation, about somebody as a human being and their self-worth, and that even if they can stay, they're still valuable as a human. I, you know, I was very interested when you're talking about the anxiety. I work in DNI work for domestic issues, and you know, the, the level of anxiety that people have around race and gender, or the, the Me Too movement, you know, it's just so high. And, you know, even though we, we don't like it when people say, oh, but not me, I don't know what the influence that is X, Y, Z, you know, that's kind of what I feel fear about, that, that their community is just no longer there. And even though you don't want to say, well, but it's not about you, it is about them. So you don't have to address At that, that moment, it's about them. <laughs> so what exactly do you do in a situation like that? What do you say? You know, I think I'm really lucky to work with mostly students who are really interested and involved in, in social justice work already. Um, I, I do a lot of caveats. You know, I spend a lot of time in presentations saying, like, you know, I, I believe we all have good intentions, and, and I'm trying to, and I try to connect people back to their good intentions. So I work with a transition. Spend, I, I actually ask them to identify their values and then ask them to meet their values and then go back and connect it back to them. So it's not about me telling them what to do, but about their desire to fulfill their value of being a compassionate physician or an empathetic physician, or even one who cares about money and just wants to, you know, so, um, which is, you know, reality. And I, yeah. so. But she has empathetic, so she doesn't grimace when they say that. No, that sounds, that sounds like a good strategy. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Anxiety question? Anyone? I have a great solution because I'm thinking now not only about expats, but 
the anxiety that this country has about people who don't look like you, who don't come from the same place as you do. So uh, I don't think a lot of people are eliminating their anxiety right now. I'm a little bit of a loss. I'm not asking for a mm -hmm. one size fits all. But you don't want me to solve the issue of the day. The problem with dealing with anxiety is it's completely different for each person. They all have their own things that cause them That's anxiety. True. Sometimes you think, oh, giving them knowledge, and some people that would cure their anxiety. But others, it's you know just making sure someone's there to with, to pick them up at the airport. And that's their anxiety is just how to get from point A to point B when they start. Otherwise, they're in the yeah, that's a good point. So part of it is knowing people really well. Okay, I see. I see two hands back here. I think empathy has a lot to do with reducing anxiety. Yes, you can show empathy. Uh, right, and they're, they they get to a little bit more comfortable zone. Yeah. So one of the things I shared, some of the that we involved with. Even with the budgets, we always have two things. Make sure the participants play when we're holding the nerves. There's overused people who are in and the other is the power of music and dance. And I used to run a program, and they always did. If you come training program, they always made sure that the middle of the week, we found a place, more folks, to the actual Latin America, and the middle of the kids. And that changed the dynamic of the kids. For you, but you can do the sports too. But a lot of formal training programs focus on the fashion and don't focus on the downtime and the downtime is that people are more That's what we Honestly, you could play Pharrell's happy song <laughs> at that. It works like a works. charm at the beginning of any workshop. If you play that, I tell you, you can feel it. Uh -huh. And people I, I didn't see that in a textbook, oh. but <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> yes, Lisa. One of the things that interests me um, is your pyramid in one of your slides. And the bottom is this threshold trait. Yes. If you could speak a little bit, I guess it's kind of related to this question of what, are, what should we be looking for? Yeah, what should you be looking for? In recruiting and selecting. Okay. Well, in, in global leadership, uh, and incidentally, that that pyramid was created uh, with a like a, a Delphi technique with a bunch of uh, experts. We talked about it for a long time, and uh, you know passed it around. But so by threshold traits, we we meant what is difficult to train and change in people, but crucial for global leaders. And we decided that that was resilience. I mean, now I think we've this. I think people are doing more resilience training, right? And, and having having success with that. But you know, we didn't at that time. People weren't doing that. So I would, you know, I would be willing to move somewhat on that one. But we had resilience. We had integrity because, you know, if you don't have integrity, it's so hard to give it to you in a weekend. It's just so <laughs> very difficult. Um, I mean, occasionally there are people that have had some what we call a come to Jesus moment in their life. You know, they've completely screwed up and they're really open to. But I wouldn't bet on that if I was selecting people as an HR person. That's not you know come to Jesus. You know, it's <laughs> probably not on the list. <laughs> um, humility is in there, and why do you think we stuck that in there? These are global leaders. These are these are people with. Big jobs, and yet we say humility. You have to know what you don't know. Yep. To be eager to learn, willing to learn. Yep, that's true. I was just going to, on that same note, it's like, yeah, if you don't have humility, you have no like, impetus to like, learn or grow as a person because you already think that you're present. Yeah, you've got it all, and you're just too busy telling other people <laughs> about it too, usually, to, to listen and, and do much good. And curiosity was on there too. And again, since that time, people have focused on training people in curiosity. But it's a it's a it's a pretty big factor. Yes. To, to take this one step further, Joyce. I mean, it sounds like there are some people for whom this does not work. There's not the safe or is it kind of maybe this 
You mean what doesn't work? Uh, Developing them or what? I mean, given given maybe an initial assessment of threshold characteristics and skills, the amount of risk for yeah. and resources to get them oh, right. may mean that you're not stupid. Uh, yes. Maybe we can talk about how to make that. How to make that what? How to understand that dynamic that we may think that these things make our world better, not only to develop skills for expats, but mm -hmm. also in our own increasingly diverse and cultural relations domestically, but if it's not for everybody, or not for the students, how do we how do we square it? Mm. You know what I thought of first before then I maybe really listen to your question. <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was I was thinking about how much trouble these will cause organizations who are not well suited for to be an expatriate or to be a Peace Corps volunteer. You know, that they just seem to suck up so much of our time away from other things that we could be doing that that I believe really strongly in selecting people out. I mean, I don't want to be too harsh on people, but, but you know, if we've looked at several data points, not just one assessment instrument, you know, you, for selection, you would never just use one data point. But then I think if we looked carefully and looked at past behavior, that's the best predictor of future behavior. I, I am kind of a firm believer in, okay, let's not waste our time there and potentially ruin our reputation, blah, blah, blah. But that really wasn't your question, was it? If you liked it, I'm willing to stop there, though. <laughs> to, to take it further, again, I'm on the mid time, so I'm, I'm also not being very prepared. Um, but the further, the further question would be, um, as a missionary organization, and believing that this is good, right. we want to be bringing and want to be developing in as many people as possible, particularly those who are less inclined to right. see the light, if you will. Um, are there behavioral nudges that work? Are there ways to kind of think about getting to that approach? So, of course, it really is the familiar set of things that we're at the lead And I'm asking, thanks for providing Back to the issue of the day. Um, I believe in. If I'm talking about people in a class or in a workshop, I believe in somewhere after I've formed a learning community so that they're comfortable, then I believe in having them fail. Not a horrific failure, but a planned failure, you know, a, a simulation that's difficult enough to make people realize that they don't know everything to make them a little bit humble, right? And then I watch them like a hawk, you know. Are they are they taking to this? And usually they do. But then if it's if it's if it's someone who who doesn't seem to be at all predisposed to this, I think I think if you keep at them, I mean, you, you know, we're we're talking moving the needle, right? We might be just moving from here to here with some people. But I think if you accept them and and think carefully about what could possibly be done with them that you can eventually make some headway but i'm not talking about you know i'm not trying to change i don't want to say the words <laughs> you know what i mean these are these are normal people i'm dealing with i'm not talking about people who have made it their life's work to be completely opposed to what i'm trying to what I'm trying to do. Does that make sense? And, I, and I honestly, I think you stay at it, stay at it, stay at it, and then usually they come around. 